Hello everyone and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. This is the show where you ask us questions that are very timely and I have three great panelists here who will be answering those questions. So we hope that you have a good question ready for us and you'll be hearing some answers. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. So my areas will be with cut flowers and maybe perennials. And you're gonna find out who else is here and direct your calls towards their expertise. I'm gonna start first with you, Dyke Barkley. Okay, my name's Dyke Barkley from down at Paris, Illinois and Barkley Farms Nurseries. And then I teach horticulture at Lakeland College in Mattoon. Um, I brought a couple of plants with me that, that aren't necessarily new, but they're Japanese anemone. And I noticed mine are getting ready to open maybe in the next day or so. And it, it's a plant that's probably happiest with a little bit of afternoon shade. But once you get it started, it's gonna be very low maintenance. And you're gonna see these, uh, I mean, the cultivar is September charm. I think mine are gonna bloom early, but they, they do fill in. I mean, my patch is probably 10 feet by 15 feet. Um, very carefree. I mean, they, they are gonna take a space up, but it's gonna be a very carefree situation where there's almost no maintenance. And that, that's what I like when I'm looking at a perennial, something that doesn't take much maintenance. And it's so pretty with the dark on the outside. Yeah, dark pink on the outside, light pink on the inside. They're so tall this year because of the wet spring. Yeah, yeah. They But look these good. are just right. They do look good. Oh, I love it. Thanks very much, Dyke. That's a great show and tell. And I'm gonna go on to you next, Kelly Alsup. Okay, hi, thank you, Diane. My name is Kelly Alsup. I am a horticulture educator in Extension. I, uh, I, serve Livingston, McLean, and Woodford counties. Uh, my expertise is usually greenhouse management and indoor plants, but uh, I teach a lot about pollinators, garden pests, and beneficial insects. Uh, that tends to be what I get a lot of requests on programs for. But I um, wanted to talk today about straw bell gardening. It, I know it's this, this hip new trend, but I read the book and I decided I was going to start it. And I actually have started um, quite a large straw bell garden um, at the extension office. And here you see us starting to condition the straw bells. This was in late April, where we added some organic fertilizers and uh, watered it in. So that was called cooking the bell. We did that for two weeks. Then we planted plants, um, vet, lots of vegetables for the nutrition program. And we also started some seed. And um, it was it's actually uh, been a really cool starting the seed. I just put a layer of soil underneath the paper towel, put uh, seeds on top of the paper towel, some soil on top, and in a week, that paper towel is gone. Uh, because of the wet weather this spring, I didn't really have to water that much. And um, I had a, a, a bumper crop of mushrooms, however, we can't eat those. <laughs> um, there you go, you see the wet weather. So I think because of the wet weather, I and I was using organic fertilizer, which is really low in nitrogen, I was getting a bit of a nutrient deficiency. So I actually switched over to uh, a chemical fertilizer with uh, higher nutrition. And now it is doing fabulous. I love the straw bell gardening. And my favorite part about it, Diane, is <laughs> I have not weeded once <gasps> this summer. What? And I'm getting lots of tomatoes, lots of herbs and produce off of it. And uh, I didn't have very good soil, so it really solved a lot of my problems in gardening. And you put petunias in the side. I did, so I, you pretty. know, I am a horticulturist yes. and I like flowers, so I was definitely trying to put a little flowers in there too to make it pretty. You may have inspired many people to do that, including me. I uh, might try this. I, I'm surprised that it hasn't just swept the entire Illinois because of the no weeding thing. Well, that's true. We had uh, folks on our Germany trip who are straw bale gardeners, John and Jane, so. I was thinking about it even then. I actually plan to do a fall crop and I plan to keep them over winter and plant in them again next spring. And then you'll just have nice mulch for the third year. Yes, it's, I, I, I compare it to uh, you know growing vegetables in your compost pile while it's breaking down. Yeah, 
whether you plant them or not. <laughs> I've had that well, happen. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Kelly, very much. Thank you. And now I'm going to turn it over to you, Shane Cultra. I am Shane Cultra, uh, one of the family owners of Country Arbor's Nursery and a huge supplier of straw bales in the local area. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, uh, we no, sell perennials, <laughs> trees, shrubs, uh, all kinds of things at the nursery. We, we grow plants, so we grow millions of different plants. And so my questions are always trees, shrubs, perennials, problems with all of them. It's kind of like this show every single day at the mm -hmm. nursery. So pretty much anything to do with green plants that live in this area. Not as good with house plants because I don't get home very often. But today, we have a lot of people always looking for uh, stuff in the fall. That's mums, we, we sell thousands of mums and mums are great, but you're looking for things that are a little different, that are pretty, that are cold tolerant, that can take you in. And a lot of people forget the celosia or coxcomb is one of them that can take a lot of cold weather. And a lot of people in the spring notice that flower. Let's see if we can get it over here. Yeah, that flower is, uh, is, is the traditional coxcomb, but it develops into these, I call them brain flowers. They look like little brains to me. They will take a lot of cold weather and they grow really fast. You can seed them so you don't, it doesn't cost very much. A big pot like this is $5. So rather than a mum, you can put a $5 coxcomb, get you lots of color, some height, some, uh, you know, something that looks a little different than a mum in for the fall season. And this is about... What, two and a half? Yeah, it's, it's about two and a half feet tall. And we we did start them in the spring, but you can let somebody else start them and just buy them. It's an and easy I way to trim do. them and dry them and have them go They're in. They're great flowers. You know, I, I've, I'm Christmas familiar with the, the spiky ones, but I, those are, these are a little more old fashioned, so we haven't really done a lot of them, but we're making, we're trying to make them have come back. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> and I'll say this, uh, maybe with the nurseryman not hearing it, but they self sew. Yes. And so then you do get them the yeah, next wh year. Yeah, whether you like it or not. That's and, right. And, and that's how we grow them from seed. And that's what makes them inexpensive. It doesn't mm -hmm. take a lot. You don't have to do that's cuttings right. and those kinds. Well, very good. So. Good suggestion. These are great show and tells. We would like to hear from you. There are no callers right now, so we're waiting to hear from you. While we are waiting, let's go to our special Did You Know next. Poinsettias were named after the first United States minister to Mexico, Joel Poinsett, who brought them back to the U.S. from Mexico in 1825. Remember that because I've seen that in a lot of trivia uh, questions, so remember that, Joel Poinsett. All right, we're gonna go, we're waiting for callers, so we're gonna go back around. We've got lots of show and tell and emails, so Dyke, I wanna go back to you. All right. I've got a question here, it was on Japanese tree lilac, and they've got a tree, or a tree lilac that's 15 years old, and their question is, occasionally in the spring they had a branch come out that had some black on it, and uh, they're doing everything correctly. They've gone in and pruned it out, just make sure the pruners are clean and cleaned afterwards, but the tree goes ahead and looks like it does fine, blooms fine, everything's going fine. So I'm gonna say, don't do anything different. I wouldn't worry about it. There are a few diseases, that can, but most of the time Japanese tree lilacs are pretty carefree. It could be something as simple as a uh, a late cold snap knocking it or something. But if as long as the tree looks good and it's flowering good, I wouldn't mess with it. Tree lilacs this year look great. Um, if you're not familiar with them, they have white blooms in June on 20 foot uh, tall, uh, uh, large shrubs or small trees. It's a, good, it's a very good plant, but if you're not having anything but a few black branches, prune those out like you are and, and go on. And the those lilacs, some talk about the ones that you deadhead and the ones that you don't for the lilacs. Because those you can, can you leave those the? Yeah, the tree lilacs. Yeah, yeah the tree you, lilacs. you mean yeah, as far which, as having to get in? And, yeah. yeah. Which ones do you deadhead and which ones don't you? Well, I, I don't do a lot. Are you talking about the repeat blooming ones? To, to no, just in general, just, just so people. They're always asking, when do I, do I cut these back or not? Yeah, cutting back lilacs you would do later in the season after they're done blooming if you're going to. But on the tree lilacs, just leave the blooms, and they've actually got a few that don't produce very much seed heads to them now. Uh, they're kind of pretty. The old one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So and, and they're all over the pretty. studio. If you ever mm -hmm. visit the studio, there are tons of them. Because we remember we had show and tell, or we had a little event around here, and everybody kept saying, "What are those beautiful trees?" And they are gorgeous. And then we use the seed heads in the spring. It's really an interesting plant to get so many seasons. But you guys use the seed heads of everything. Yeah, <laughs> we do. Floral <laughs> decorators <laughs> grab but everything. We don't use the regular uh, lilacs, you know, yeah. the shrub, not so much. Not I much. tend to deadhead those, but. Okay, yeah. thank you for answering that good question, and we're gonna go on to you, Kelly. 
Okay, um, I'm going to answer a question about red wigglers from Carl in Springfield. Um, first of all, he says he enjoys the program very much, Thank Diane. you, Carl. So uh, I'm sure that's very nice to hear. Um, he has a large pond and there's um, lots of algae in it. And he wants to rake it out and wants to know if it would be good to put on a compost pile where he has red wigglers. Well, um, most definitely algae would uh, be, uh, the, the worms would be able to eat that algae and break that nitrogen down into worm castings and would do exactly what you would want it to do. Um, at just as long as you add, you know, the right mixture of greens and browns. When when composters talk greens and browns, greens is that fresh cucumber peels, which algae would fall into that category, and browns are um, straw or uh, uh, fall leaves. So a nice mix of that, and then I always add a little bit of soil in just to add that nat that bacteria. And um, just so you know, I have some red wigglers at home. They're on the kitchen table. Yes, on the kitchen table, we just <laughs> throw our, our, some of our scraps in there and it, they form that beautiful soil. I go add it onto my house plants and never smells, is amazing. Whoa. You would never know I had it in my house. You are a geek horticulturalist. That is really great. Without a doubt. <laughs> that is really good. And I love I love creepy crawly insects, so I you know Get your questions ready. The worms <laughs> with the roaches and the and right now I'm um, raising polythemus moths. Wow. I should have brought those, huh? Yeah, yeah, next time you do that. <laughs> Wow, how interesting. You know, we're all geeks in a different way. You just happen to be in that particular way. It's easy and fun. Huh. And it's great with kids. Kids Some love people it. are out there going, ew. Don't, I raise them in the greenhouse. Yeah. I don't have them in the house. Don't feed the worms the at dinner time. <laughs> well, good. Thanks for that. I'm glad you answered that question. You are an expert. That's why I picked out the question. <laughs> okay. Well, now I am going to go to a caller, and then I'll come back to you if that sounds all right for all you, right. Shane. That's fine. Let's go to line two. We have a question about crepe myrtle. Hi, line two. Yes, uh, I was wondering, can you grow crepe myrtle, the bushes, or the trees here in central Illinois? I have a crepe myrtle, and it's I've had it for maybe 15 years. It, 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 some people have good luck and others don't. I think it's got to be a little bit more protected. I, I think if you lived out in the open prairie like I do, I would, don't think I'd try it. But I know Larry's got a bunch down in Charleston. Uh, and Mine came, was a variety from the National Arboretum, so it... And the, hot, the more north you can get your source. Yeah, is it smaller too? Yes, it yeah, you never can't, becomes a if tree. If you picture the big trees down south, I, those don't, they, they were just too cold or every so often they get knocked back. So it seems to be the shorter, but there are some cultivars that are definitely more hardy and they always have a tendency to be, I don't mean ridiculously short, but if you've been down south and seen the trees that look like crab apples, that that we can't do down yeah, here. Yeah, you might have here. to take a picture and put that around because mine, <laughs> mine is maybe four feet and they die back to the ground every probably three out of four years. And the years they don't, they, they get a little bit bigger, maybe six. But it's not the focal point of my yeah, and don't garden. come visit Diane's. Don't uh, I mean honestly, yeah, you, it's, it's really tough plant to get. You, I always tell people for all the ones <laughs> that we see, nice. We don't see the other hundred that yeah. didn't make that's it. That's right. It's it's really not made for Central Illinois. Yeah, yeah and so that's why I have one. Yeah, <laughs> because if it didn't work. And I've sold fifty or a hundred Hopis and other Reds over the years that are supposed to be hardy, and that's fine until two year two winters ago mm -hmm. where it's not hardy. And mine is still doing good, so I must have gotten just the right spot, but. It is something you'd need to think about. There is a foundation near it, and it's protected by shrub border. Yeah, use a microclimate like they do down in Charleston. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for your question. We're gonna go on to a question about gooseberries, and this is on line three. Hi there. Hi, hello. Yes, what's your question? Uh, yeah, I live in Humboldt. I bought a couple of gooseberry bushes from the master gardeners a few years back, and they're coming up real good, but. I was wondering, how do you propagate them, like start new ones? Okay, I'm looking at you, Shane, but I, you I know, I, I, I really don't know the official. I t we do cuttings for everything. So we, 
you know, you probably, I don't know if you can divide them or not. We do tip cuttings on all our fruits just because I can do them by the thousands that way. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm not sure if you can dig them up or divide them. I, we haven't done gooseberries that well. We do sell gooseberries though. Uh, they uh, amazingly I, sell well. Can't but you I can, root those like a blackberry though? Just take a tip cutting. And yeah, that's and that's how we do it. But I don't know if you can dig up a clump. So almost as well. like a layering. Yeah. 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 You might try the layering. Yeah. Because if just, you didn't I, get it, it wouldn't. We it just wouldn't use hurt. a dip and grow. I mean, literally a cut, a dip, and then we put them in a mist house. So we we kind of have a fancy one, but I don't think you have to get them. I think they root pretty easily, pretty readily. So, Doc, well, I'd be you tempted saying, on your case where you've got the existing plant. Could you bend it over oh, you, and yeah. try a layering, and where you take the end of the branch and actually put it down in the dirt? If it doesn't stay, just figure out a way to fasten it. And you may need to do like a little wound, but see if you can get that to root, and then chop that off after it gets started. Uh, but if you just look up somewhere information on layering, I, I think you could do that since you already have an existing plants. So that may be the easiest mm -hmm. way. Okay, so very good question, and I, it sounds like it would work. So, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. We're going to go on to a blue spruce question. This is line four. Hi there. Hi. Uh, I have a blue spruce. I live in St. Louis, mm -hmm. and it has a lot of bagworms on it, and the front side of it appears to be dead, but the top is not dead. I was wondering if it is savable or if it should be cut down. I just answered a question on bagworms today. Um, uh, as far as bagworms are concerned, they are treatable, uh, but that would be early, uh, late May, early June, when they're actually, the eggs are hatching and uh, crawling around on your trees. Right now, they are, in, the females are in bags. In the fall, the males will come out and fly around to go to those bags and visit the females. But really at this point in time, the only thing you can do to get rid of bagworms would be to pick them off, which can be very hard to do in a large tree. And, uh, but uh, you would go ahead and uh, if you want to uh, treat that, treat that again in the spring with uh, something that kills like a BT. But I'd say cut it down because she's already said that half of it's dead and on evergreens, dead does not come back. It never flushes from a dead evergreen. Unless yeah, if, it's it's, really if you got short. a pretty good hunk of it that's brown or gone, then it's going to take a while. To, it, it's not very good at coming back out. Yeah. Just to follow up on the picking them off, though, just don't make the mistake of picking them off and dropping them at the base of the tree. Yeah. Because then they just come out and <laughs> reinfect. So make sure that you take them off site. A burning bucket is fun. Yes. Uh huh. Anything that makes sure that they're gone. I actually think a, like a bald cypress or a white pine is much better in our Illinois landscape than blue spruces. I love bald cypress. I do too. But if yeah. they do want evergreens, yes, I you understand. Can go with the white pine. I love. Uh, white fur, the cone yeah. color furs, I just love those. And Black Hill Spruce has been, oh, been doing so it. And that has a really nice blue tinge if you get a good cultivar. Mm -hmm. Blue spruce is a good plant, it just doesn't handle stress well. And when we have a dry year, if you don't water, it doesn't matter if it's 20 years old or 20 months old, it has to be watered. If not, it'll get disease. So, and it's slower growing. That's the only downside. Yeah, but it's the, beautiful. The, the and color it's so is dense. unmatched. Yeah, it's blue. And they got them so blue now, they're sky blue all the way through. Mm -hmm. They're just beautiful plants. So, but if you like that look, then maybe Black Hill Spruce. I don't know. But yeah, in do. June, look for bagworms. It's, that's the key. When yes. you see them, it's almost too late. Okay. Well, thank you for that question. And now we're going to do an orchid question. This is on line six. Hi there. Hi. How are you? Doing great. What's I, your... I enjoy your show. Thanks so much. What's your question? I have, uh, was given an orchid. Uh, the first part of May, and it was just beautiful. It had five blooms on each side of the uh, trunk going up, stem going up, and plus some uh, uh, buds on the end. And uh, they, of course, have all fallen off now. But So I was just wondering what my next step would be to, will it ever bloom for me again, or will it, uh, should I cut anything off of it, or? Well, you've called on the right day. Okay, <laughs> Kelly, take it away. 
Well, you definitely want to take that flowering stalk off because now you want it to grow a little bit more roots. Uh, I am a big advocator of fertilizing your orchids because that will get them to start reblooming. Um, they do, um, uh, you know, sometimes like that little resting period. They're not going to they're not going to bloom continuously all year long. Uh, I, I think a lot of people uh, try to pot them up too soon, so I would not pot it up. And um, I would definitely use a mister to mist those leaves, mist those white aerial roots that actually absorb the water. And um, yeah. And wait. <laughs> And wait, wait yeah. yeah. And you know, if it, the the really cool uh, orchid trick that I have is if I ever get a broken blossom, if you um, you know cut it back to that third node, which is where you'll see you know a little you know um, a little green spots around yeah. the the flowering stalks, it'll actually rebloom from that. So but, that's well worth it. But you know, if they like humidity, they like you know warm temperatures. I have a phalaenopsis that reblooms every year. Oh, I, I, just, did, yeah. I just group it with my other house plants, and it. Phalaenopsis really well. like being grouped together. That we, creates more humidity. Mom has one that that bloomed almost a year and a half before it stopped. Wow. It just kept sending out more, and yeah. just had a few, and, and it finally did. But it went almost a year and she a half. She does have a green thumb. Oh. That's <laughs> impressive. Was it grouped with other plants, or just in nah, a nice warm location? There was location? a few other orchids, but no, it's just. And some of the others didn't bloom that long at all. It's just this one particular plant did. Wow, that is really impressive. Great. Well, that's a great question. Thank you so much for that. I think we'll just uh, go right to the line five question about pussy willow trees. Hi there. Hi. I got a start of a pussy willow tree this spring. It's growing tall. It looks great, except for the leaves. And they look terrible. It looks like they have chicken pox or something. And so every leaf is awful, but it just keeps growing. And so I feel like it's not dead. Uh, I have no idea. Okay, so lots of leaf spot, sounds like. Who wants to jump in? Dyke, would you like well, to? Well, I don't know. Pussy willow is a tough plant, so I don't know as I would get real concerned. Uh, uh, typical willow, it it has a lot of problems, but usually can turn around and grow out of it. I don't. I think it was mine, I probably wouldn't do anything. I mean, we've had really a screwy spring, a screwy <laughs> summer, lots of moisture. I, I, if it's good and healthy, otherwise you see new growth coming out, I don't know as I'd do anything. Uh, the only thing I'd warn you on a pussy well is eventually they'll get huge, so don't be afraid to prune back on it. But uh, I don't know if I would jump in at this point and try it. You're talking about a fungus mm. of some kind or a disease. Yeah, I mean, I always tell people this, once you get into August, the leaves have done their job. There's really not, by the middle of August, you don't really even need leaves anymore. It's all stored. Don't treat it. Yeah. Just let it go. And I can attest, I have 10 pussy willows at the nursery. They look just like yours. So I'm supposed to be the professional, and they look just as bad as yours. And there's all kinds of horse chestnuts look terrible. Service <laughs> berries have even struggled in some yeah, areas. Some and right. there's not a crab around with a leaf on it. Even the new varieties developed to be blight resistant and excellent disease resistant. It's just, you know, when you get 12 inches, 13 inches of rain, mm -hmm. Wherever you live in the country, the trees are going to struggle. Now we're getting nothing. So you just have this mm -hmm. whole world's environment just confusing all the plants. So, Shane, I'm going to segue into <laughs> yeah. your question if you would uh, do that email. Yeah, this will save everybody a lot of time, at least in the nursery business. The, the crab trees look terrible, plain and simple. We have a que uh, cus or customer. We have a uh, question that says, last year there were only a few branches near the top of the tree and it got worse during the summer and this year it looks just as bad is essentially what they're saying. And stress and crab trees don't go well together. In the old days we used to call it Boo Radley's tree like a, a to kill a mockingbird, the old scary trees because they look beautiful in the spring. As soon as it got hot, they would drop their leaves. And the new varieties are much, much better. They keep their leaves better. They don't get the leaf spot nearly as bad. But when you get drought and you get, or you get really wet and then the water backs off, the trees get confused. They're used to having a certain amount. They're not getting it now. So trees react one way. If they think that they're struggling or stressed, 
they get rid of the leaves. That's what mm -hmm. they have to take care of, so they just toss them. And that's what you're seeing right now. It's nothing to be concerned. Next year won't make a, a bit of difference. It's this year. She wants to know what she can do to prepare for next year, and there's <laughs> nothing she can do. Water it. If you know that it's going to be a dry year, just like your lawn, water your trees. Trees that are older still need water. You, you need to give a little bit extra. So that's what I say. Try and look past it. Some people can't, but you should. Do you have a rule for how much you tell people to water? I, I should, but uh, I, <laughs> I usually say, uh, it, it depends on the size of the tree, but I usually say a, a, like a dime size or a nickel size trickle, and I usually leave it on for a half hour for a six inch trunk. Uh, there's a gallon, my dad's got it all on a sheet that I hand them usually, but uh, I usually let, let it soak until it runs off, and that's a lot of water on some big trees, but big trees need water also. Okay, yeah. we had to get that one in. It was a perfect one. <laughs> well, I want to thank each of you for watching. We'll see you next week. Goodbye.